Hello everyone and thank you for tuning in to episode 2 of this season being recorded on a nice cool 109 degree Thursday afternoon. Um, It obviously gets ridiculously hot here in Las Vegas and on top of that I work in an outdoor environment through the summer so it's really crucial that I'm not wearing jewelry that's going to break down and irritate my skin, turn it green, anything like that. Um, And luckily, I found a jewelry company that can withstand the hot weather here in Vegas. It's called Ana Luisa, spelled A-N-A-L-U-I-S-A. And they are a carbon neutral jewelry company that sells a wide variety of environmentally friendly pieces. And when I say environmentally friendly, I really mean environmentally friendly. In 2020, this company actually became carbon neutral, counterbalancing the entirety of its CO2 footprint for a net zero output. So every piece of your collection is going to be carbon invisible. They drop new collections every Friday, so they are constantly offering new pieces, and their stuff is made from materials like sterling silver, stainless steel, brass, and even solid gold. That's part of the reason why you never have to worry about it turning your skin green, so that is a plus for people like me who have sensitive skin. On top of that, they are also super fair priced with their pieces starting at $39, And for an even bigger discount, you can use my code ELEPHANTS for 10% off anything you purchase. If you type in the URL shop.analuisa.com slash elephants, that will take you straight to their website where you will see their selection of rings, earrings, necklaces, bracelets, all that good stuff. And again, use my code ELEPHANTS for 10% off your purchase. They run sales across our website um, pretty frequently, which is super nice. But if you guys want the guaranteed discount, go ahead and use that URL, URL, which is again shop.analuisa.com slash elephants and use the code elephants for 10% off. Thank you. So given that it's June, I wanted to make sure to include this week's episode before the end of Pride Month. The reason being because my guest this week is Sophia Cavallari and she is transgender. Now, it sort of goes without saying as to why this is such an appropriate topic for the nature of my show. This is obviously an area that has received a lot of attention over the entirety of it being a socially recognized concept in general, um, but especially in the last decade or so. So on that note, I want to be completely transparent and authentic with both Sophia and my audience in that the intense social stigma over this particular topic makes this interview more challenging for me to navigate than some of my previous episodes and I ask for everyone's patience and understanding as I conduct this interview for myself but especially for Sophia. Coming onto a public platform like this and sharing such personal and intimate details about your sexuality and your mental health and all of that stuff is totally daunting so power to you for sharing all of this with us and using it as an opportunity to educate others. Um, now let me get off my pedestal and let you say hello. Um, Sophia, could you please introduce yourself and maybe start from the beginning and tell us a little bit about your background growing up? Absolutely. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Really excited to be here. Um, my name is Sophia Cavallari. I was born in Tucson, Arizona. I'm 25 years old. Um, I have three siblings, a bunch of nieces, so I'm never having kids, just so you know. Um, and... I don't know. So I grew up with mostly just my dad. My parents got divorced when I was about 10 years old. And it was a bit of a hectic environment. I didn't know then who I was. I say that, but there were hints. Um, So I don't know. My journey didn't really start in this portion of my life until a little bit later. But either way, yeah. Nice. Okay, cool. Um, My parents also divorced when I was, I was not I feel like 10 is probably a more difficult age to go through something like that because you're more aware of things. Uh, Mine divorced when I was like two or three. Mm -hmm. So I just grew up with divorced parents. Um, How how was that for you? Did you still have a relationship with both of like both your mom and dad? Yeah, I think regardless, it's difficult. So sorry you had to go through that as well. But I had a relationship with both. My mom ended up being a traveling nurse for a little bit. So she was not out of the picture, but she was just kind of doing her own thing, making money to be able to support us. Um, And I really did have a solid relationship with my dad, but things kind of changed after he got diagnosed with Parkinson's disease shortly after when I was about 11 years old. Um, And over time, our relationship kind of faded, I guess. So we don't really speak now. It has nothing to do with this side of me. He has nothing. He doesn't even really know, actually. Um, 
So yeah, I live with my mom now though. So we okay. have a nice like close knit family. Okay. My um my grandpa passed from Parkinson's, so I know how hard that is. That's a whole added layer to everything you're already going through. Um, so one thing that I would really like to establish before we jump into any more intricate details about your life, um, is I would just sort of like for you to share what it feels like on a human level, um, to feel like you're not in the right body, if that's even what it feels like, because I feel like some people probably genuinely lack the ability to understand what that is like by no fault of their own, you know, like there's no way for people to just completely live alternate experiences. Um, but I do feel like that's where a lot of the lack of empathy comes from regarding this topic. So as best as you can, can you please just relay what it feels like, I guess, to realize that you wish something was different? Yeah. And I absolutely think you're right because a lot of people don't have any experience with trans people. So that's part of why they have no idea what it would be like to be trans. So for me, I did at a young age kind of feel like something was different with me. Um, I played sports. I had a lot of guy friends. It's not like that wasn't the issue. But in the back of my mind, I knew there was this like femininity to me that I couldn't really express. Um, and over time, that continued to grow. And I would go back and forth between like suppressing it and embracing it and suppressing it and embracing it. And people probably thought I was crazy because I was out here showing myself and then like being really rec reclusive and saying like, oh no, that wasn't me. Like I didn't do that. You're crazy. Um, and it just made no sense because that pattern went on for such a long time. So when I finally did accept and realize like, you know, this is me, um, it was kind of a weird experience because then what? What do you do after that? You know, it's like, what is the next step? Are hormones going to be enough? Like, is transitioning going to be enough to make you feel that euphoria? You know, like that kind of gender euphoria that would make me feel like the woman that I am. And that's just something that's so difficult to navigate because, like I said in the beginning, there's not as many trans people, like, visible these days. I mean, more now than there was before, that's <laughs> for sure. But when you don't really have a lot of role models to look up to, it's like, how do you navigate your path? You know, what do you what do? You do? Mm -hmm. Um, so this was an ongoing thing. It wasn't like a specific moment where you were like, oh, like, did you think that maybe you could be gay or like you always knew that it was something like totally more than that? I guess like at what age, um, and like, did you start to contemplate like, oh, like I can tell mm -hmm. or, and like, what did that look like mentally? So I think. Probably around like 12 or 13 is when I started to express myself um, like in terms of like the clothes that I would wear. Um, and it just felt so like weird because I had to be like secretive and I didn't want anybody to know. So it's like I'm going to these stores and like trying on outfits and like not buying them. And I'm like going over to my friend's house who I do trust and being like, hey, like, wouldn't it be funny if I like what like literally it's like, how do you even go about approaching that? at an age and a time where people don't really accept it and you can't put yourself out there. So like, I don't know, there was never really a moment in time, but there were hints where I was like, there's something different to me. And it's funny that you brought up the idea of like me um, questioning my sexuality. Uh, people always ask me that, like from age 12, they were like, hey, like, are you gay? Like, somebody told me you were gay. Like, I heard that you liked guys, like, that's totally fine. And in my mind, I was like, it's not that I don't, but I'm never going to discredit the fact that I still like women. Like, for the record, I'm pansexual, um, which means I'm attracted to anybody, all genders. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. That actually, that kind of thing pushed me back a while. People asking me if I was gay made me question everything about myself because I was like, if I'm feminine, can I still like women? Do I have to pick one or the other? And that was like a struggle within itself. Yeah, I mean, young people already struggle with you know, kind of figuring out who they are. So that's like a really tough version of figuring out who you are. And as far as like, you know, people asking that question, I guess like around, you said you're 25, so mm -hmm. I'm 23, so you're a little bit older. But around that age, I think that um, being gay at that time was more like socially recognized and acceptable than being trans. So that was like, you know, and I guess still, at the current day and age, you know, that's something that people are more familiar with. And it's been like, there's been a little bit more, um, like progress in that movement, I guess. Um, 
So maybe that's why, you know, that's like their first instinct is to be like, oh, are you gay? And, you know, yeah, I I get it. Because that probably makes you think like, well, am I gay? Am I, is that what this is? Like, I can't even imagine how difficult that must be to just like not really have a clear idea of what's going on. Because like for me, I've known, um, you know, since I was young that I was attracted to to boys, to men. Um, and that's never been something that, like, I thought twice about. Um, so I just, it's got to be, like, especially at 12 and 13 when you're not even, like, fully developed psychologically. It must be, like, really hard and heavy, like, on your shoulders. Did you struggle with it? Like, was it something that was more interesting to you? Or was it actually, like, taking a toll on your mental health at that age? Oh, it was difficult. Um yeah. Without getting too far into it, I was absolutely depressed when I was in middle and high school. Um, I was in like really dark times because it was exactly like that. Like you said that from when you were young, you knew that you liked men. For me, it was kind of the opposite. And then because I knew I liked women and then people would always try and tell me that that's just not okay for the kind of person that I am. So literally from about like 15, 16 years old to my last relationship when I was about 21, 22. Um, I couldn't even like really be honest with my like female partners. And it made me feel so like gross and guilty because they couldn't see the real me because I had to pretend that I wasn't that version of myself just to even date a woman because I thought that's what it had to be. Um, It's not. (laughs) But Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I don't know. I think it definitely weighed on me. And, you know, I tried to find like creative outlets to to make myself feel a lot better. I would like play sports. I would find ways to incorporate fashion into my life, but not have it be seen by everybody. So there were a lot of little things that kind of carried me through it. It wasn't as hard as I want to make it seem, I guess, but it definitely was a difficult time. And I'm glad that I was able to push through to where I am now. You know? Yeah. When did you like fully commit to being totally open and public and like dressing how you want, expressing everything how you want at what age? Um, very recently, like probably, you know what, it was like 2020, very start of the pandemic. I kind of took that as like an opportunity (laughs) because I was living my life in a more like masculine way, I guess. Not really, but pretty much my daily routine was go to work, go to the gym and play basketball with my friends. And like, that was pretty much it. So when COVID hit and everything was closing, like gyms, work, everything was shutting down. I was like, okay, like this is a time for me to really embrace my other passions like what I'm really into and once I started exploring with it I made an Instagram I made like a TikTok and everything and things were kind of picking up and I was going to keep them private but I was like you know what no I'm just going to be open I just want everyone to know that this is who I am and there was so much more like support than I even expected (laughs) that's good that's what I was going to ask you next it's about like how um the different people in your life responded specifically you know, obviously your family and friends are closest to you in your circle. How did that go? Like, did people kind of expect it or was it shocking for them? Was there anyone that was, you know, not supportive and people who were supportive? Like, what did that look like? Yeah. Um, so my family first, uh, I don't know why I was afraid of my family's opinion because it's not like I grew up from like a super conservative background. Like my parents have always been very free flowing, letting us do whatever we want. Um, So they took it very well. But in my mind, I was like, no, they're going to kick me out. (laughs) Like that obviously wasn't going to happen. So they were really sweet. Um, All my women friends, phenomenal. Nobody took it the wrong way or anything. My guy friends were the ones that I was worried about. So I'm not proud of this, but I actually kind of panic blocked all of them on social media. Like after I came out, because I came out on like my old Instagram, made a new one that's like my true self, right? But I blocked all the men that were in my life because... It was a really fragile time for me, and I didn't want that period to be ruined by the opinions of other people if I didn't even know who I was myself. So in that time period, to allow myself to really grow, I had to have only supportive people in my circle. So do they know now? Oh, yeah. It's, okay. it's no secret now. I've actually yeah. ran into a few of like my old guy friends like here and there. Some have been good. Some have taken it kind of weird, but yeah. So did you, like, lose a lot of friendships with your male friends after coming out? And was that by your own choice or was that because they actually were, like, not supportive? I did lose a lot of them. I mean, I wouldn't say lose directly, but I don't know 
it, it, we're definitely not close. And I don't know if it's like my own doing, like because I blocked people, or like if it's because that they're not comfortable around me. It could be a combination of the two. But overall, I just I don't really have a lot of interactions with male or male presenting people these days. I mean, when I do, it's very positive. I just wish more of them would take the time to have a conversation with me. Um, but realistically, the people that support me more are either queer men or women or just like non-binary people in general. Are you, would you say like you're more hesitant or afraid to have like any sort of intimate relationships with men, whether it's romantic or not? Yes, yeah. in every way. Yeah. Um, why do you think that is? I think it's like a fear that I have in the back of my mind. I mean, I don't think that men are going to be like inherently like aggressive or violent with me, but there's always this fear in my mind. And I'm sure it's in the mind of all women, but trans women too, it's just this idea that at any moment it could flip, you know, and like you could be in an unsafe situation. And I just don't feel that when I'm with any like female presenting people. <laughs> so I wish I was a little more willing, though, because I think if I would be more open to, like, approaching people and starting the conversation, men specifically, I don't think it would go as bad as I think it right. is. But I just have that fear, you know? No, yeah. And this is, like, a really early part of, you know, what you're going through. You have the rest of your life as, you know, as you are now. So this is, like, the early stepping stone. So if you need, like, to protect yourself and your bubble right now, I think that that's the right choice. You know what I mean? As long as there's nothing like, not that you need my opinion or two cents, but as long as there's nothing hateful or, or spiteful or resentment about it, like it's perfectly understandable because as a woman, I can tell you like it is hard, you know, like it's more, you know, for you, it's an everyday thing, you know, because you have an added layer of being trans and that's like, you know, that's hard. You know, being a woman in general is hard, especially a trans woman. And so... For me, it's like certain environments that I'm in where it's uncomfortable for me. So like I work at the beach club with Jasmine and you work in a, a bikini all day. So it's like, you know, you're already exposed to men who have been drinking and who are um, probably not the best versions of themselves. And like we're all at a pool party, so there's a lot more skin showing. You know, I'm more prone to negative interactions with men in that environment. Or if I'm out, you know, at the club or at a bar and, like, leaving late, that's when I'm more like, oh, like, I just want to get home. I just want to get to my car. You don't go anywhere alone. Um, but especially because there's, like, you know, when it comes to, like, there's a bunch of research on this. Like, when it comes to being, like, sexually assaulted, a lot of it has to do with power for men, right? Like, whether you're trans or like, like anything, like any type of sexual assault is rooted in power. Um, but being trans, there's also probably an element rooted in hate, which is even scarier and harder. Um, so I totally understand where you're coming from. And I don't think, you know, there's definitely a level of self-awareness in you too. You know what I mean? Where it's like, this isn't a door that I want closed forever. This is just something that's really hard for me right now. And because I'm in a fragile like position, I just don't want to take the risk of setting myself back. And I think that's like understandable. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it's, it makes sense to me. Um, now I don't, I don't ask this to make you relieve any sort of trauma or anything like that. So if you can't discuss it, we can just totally move on. Um, but I would appreciate for people to be able to understand some of the interactions you've had with people who have been hateful or non-supportive of your decision, um, could you share with us maybe like one of the hardest experiences you've had with someone regarding your transition, whether it was like a stranger or someone you know, but, you know, just someone who really made you feel like shit. And it's not because I want you, like I said, to relive it, but people don't understand. So that's why I ask. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's been a few. I try my best to focus on the positive experiences, but I'd be lying if I said that the negative ones didn't happen. Um, typically, as strangers, it's not usually people I know. If people I know have a problem with me, they'll talk about me behind my back rather than to my face. Strangers are bold. They don't care. Um, one time I was walking on the strip. It was late at night, so that was kind of probably a, a trigger. Um, I... 
this was early on in my transition. I hadn't started hormones yet or anything. So like the actual physical characteristics of my body still looked fairly masculine. Um, and it's overall just people are willing to say things that they wouldn't normally say. Um, like one man yelled from the outside of a restaurant, like 50 feet away. Uh, is that a man? Super loud. Um, another guy was walking by and like, they like cat call you. So it's, there's definitely like this sexual aspect to it, but it's in a way that's very like degrading. Like he literally like complimented my skirt and then asked me if there was a cock inside it. Sorry if the, like, oh, it's, <laughs> it's a little fine. vulgar, but oh, it's just like little things like that. And then ultimately though, I wouldn't even say that it's the direct interactions, like the direct like conversations that hurt me the most i actually appreciate those way more because at least people are willing to be honest it's the little things um i love that you mentioned like the self-awareness because that's actually one of the things i kind of hate about myself is that i'm aware of everything around me so i do notice all the little glances i notice when people double take i notice when somebody whispers to the person they're standing next to or if they giggle and point and it's just like i notice all of those things and it's very hard to walk in certain public spaces because those things are just so prominent you know all right that's what i was going to ask you about is um how it has affected you know like your your confidence are are you self-conscious because you're afraid you're going to walk into a room and i'm the exact same way by the way like i'm super I'm real hard on the outside, mm -hmm. so, like, no one's ever going to know that it hurt my feelings, but I'll go home and I'll cry about it later. Like, that's just how I am. Like, I'm super empathetic and, like, it's it's a blessing and a curse, right? Like, it's, it, it's something I hate about myself because I don't have the boundaries to, like, not let it consume me. Um, it's a good trait, though. You know what I mean? It's better than being a fucking sociopath. Um but I'm the same way where, like, I notice, like, subtle changes in people's behavior, their body language. I also have a communications degree from here. So that makes you even more in tune to, like, any subtleties that are off or, like, did they say something or whatever. Um, so did you, like, since you have transitioned, do you feel more, I'm sure it's probably a blend, too, like, more self-conscious or more confident being you know, in a public environment or being around people you know? It's a little bit of both. Honestly, I think, um, I don't know where I get it from. I have this like inherent self-confidence to me where it's like no matter how shitty I feel about myself and all the things that I'll tell myself that I'm doing wrong, there is something about me that won't show it, like the hard exterior or something because I will willingly walk anywhere. I will smile and talk to anybody. I will hold my head up high regardless. But if it was a hard experience, I'm absolutely crying afterwards, you know? Um, and for example, some places like that are like more early on in my transition, actually. Now I've challenged myself and I've really gotten over a lot of those fears, but I refuse to go to like any clubs. Um, if I went any public spaces that weren't like specifically queer or gay spaces, I made a friend come with me. Um, they had to like meet me in the parking lot and walk inside with me because I couldn't walk in and get that attention from people because, you know, like, being who I am, I, I walk in a door and like everybody looks my way and then some people don't look away. And it's just like, I would like to just be treated like a normal woman, not some like zoo access like feature, you know? I don't yeah. know. It's weird. Do you feel like um, because you are so early on in this journey, do you feel like that's something that eventually you'll overcome or do you think it'll always sort of bother you a little bit? I think I'll overcome it. I think it'll get to a point where it doesn't bother me but it's not gonna go away. So in the trans community, there's something called like passing, um, which is pretty much just like a trans person's ability to be seen as the gender that they want to be seen as, like seen as the same as like their cisgender peers. So for me to pass as a woman, it would have to almost be like undetectable that I'm trans. Um, I think passing is really stupid and so do a lot of trans people. But long story short, I don't pass for a couple of reasons. Um, I think I'm very pretty. I love my features, but I'm also 6'3". My voice is a little bit deep sometimes. I have an Adam's apple that pokes out. Like, there are little things where people will just be able to be like, oh, like, that person is whatever they want to say. Um, so I kind of have to just get over that because even if I get surgeries, like, even if I just grow into the body that I'm growing into now, regardless, there's always going to be little things about me that kind of trigger some people. Right. I think of when you were talking about passing, I think of, um, do you watch Euphoria? Mm -hmm. I think of Jules because um, 
like I didn't know at all like until late, way later in the season that she was trans um in so I'm Hispanic in the Hispanic community there it's the same thing there's this thing called white passing um and like I have I'm kind of disconnected honestly from that side of me because um my biological father is how I'm Puerto Rican and I'm not really in touch with him um I have a wonderful father but father figure that has raised me since I was you know very young um but like my Hispanic side like that culture I didn't grow up with it right so but it's still in my blood you know just because I was disconnected from it doesn't change the fact that I'm Hispanic that I got made fun of for my arms or for you know having dark hair anything like that like I still went through that experience um I just didn't get the nice side of it like Mm -hmm. the fun like you know the cultural side of it Um, I have a friend who, cause I kind of, I work outside, so I'm like darker. Um, and it's, it becomes like in the summertime, I get asked more often, like, what are you? What are you? They can tell that I'm not totally white. Um, but in the wintertime I get really pale. Um, and so people just like call me a white girl or whatever. Like I did grow up white culture, but I'm not just a white girl. You know, I'm half white. My mom's white, but I have this other side of me that I am like, like, I am proud of, you know, like, it's, it's a part of my identity. I have, my best friend is Mexican, like, Mexican, Mexican, um, but she's got very pale skin, she's got green eyes, she's got, like, thinner, lighter hair, um, and she gets really frustrated because people try to use passing as a way to kind of invalidate her experience, you know, they're like, oh, well, you, you know, you don't know, what it's like to to be Mexican or to be discriminated against because you're white passing. And it's like super invalidating um, to your identity because it makes you feel like you're doing something wrong almost. Like it's your fault that you don't look a certain way or that you weren't a part of that culture. Like I had no control over it. It's literally in my blood. So I agree. I think I think passing is stupid too. Um, but it obviously like the rest of the world doesn't. And that's what sucks is that it really plays a role in people's perception and in how others like validate your identity, which in in an idealistic world, we'd love to say that we don't care what other people think of us. We'd love to say that it doesn't matter what people say behind our backs or how they perceive us. Um, But it takes like a super evolved human to just not give a fuck at all. You know, it's almost out of our instinct to not give a fuck at all because we're tribal and, you know our evolutionary theory says you know to survive we we survive in packs so it's like we do kind of care about what other people think of us um and that's just like one of those things that makes it like more difficult to just exist you know what i mean Mm -hmm. um so how has this impact impacted your mental health overall i'm assuming there's you know positives and negatives but Mm -hmm. like in the big grand scheme of things like have you i guess you know, describing like your highs and your lows, like what is a high feel like a great day? And then like, what's a low? Like, have you struggled with suicidal thoughts? I'm sure there's been some depression and anxiety there. Like maybe just give us both sides. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think overall transitioning has saved my life. Um, I have battled depression and honestly, yeah, I have battled suicidal thoughts as well. I think before we even get too far into that, I want people to understand that the stigma around mental health is absolutely ridiculous. And this is coming from somebody with um, almost a master's in psychology. So it matters. You need to be able to talk about how you're feeling. You need to be able to listen to other people talk about how they're feeling. It can't be a taboo subject because if that's happening, how are you going to how are you going to get better? You know, so going off of that, I don't really battle those thoughts so much anymore because in the grand scheme of things, I am now in the body that I want to be in. However, would I do absolutely anything to be born again as a woman, like as a cisgender woman? Yes. <laughs> I would love to be able to just live my experience that way. Would I have come out sooner if I could have? Absolutely. But ultimately, what ifs don't really matter. And I need to be living in the present with the life that I have now. And that kind of does help ground me and keep me going. And, you know, a lot of my days are really good. I 
spend a lot of time on social media. I interact with my friends. I go to work. No matter where I go, I love to interact with whoever's there. I'm just a very <laughs> extroverted person. Um, but my bad days can be kind of hard too. You know, it's the days that I don't feel like I look as feminine or I don't feel as feminine internally and it makes me feel off about myself. Or it's the days where I'm too lazy to shave and I have a little bit of stubble on my face. And I'm like, just little things that kind of add to the dysphoria that kind of remind me that I'm not exactly like all the women in my life, um, even if I am very much like them and very much included by them. I will say that women have always made me feel so, so included. And maybe that's why I've always wanted to be a part of that community as it was. But yeah, so I definitely am in a better place now, but that doesn't mean it's not hard. Yeah. Who has been the most helpful to you throughout this time? Like, is there one person that you think of and you're like, that person just a godsend? Um, a lot of my friends, but actually my mom. And it surprised me because I was never close with my mom before. I was never close with a lot of my family members. And I think it was because I felt like I had to be so secretive. And that was such an intimate part of me that I couldn't have them knowing any of those details. Um, but ever since I came out, my mom has been above and beyond supportive. Um, what's funny is she tries to tell me that I can't wear certain things when I go out. And I'm like, this is actually so affirming because this is what moms tell their daughters. So I'm like, okay, this is good. Um, so yeah, she really just does everything she can to make me feel like the best daughter in the world for her. And it's nothing, it's everything that I could ask for. That's awesome. Cause there's some people who don't have that at all you know what I mean I just saw this post on Instagram um and I shared it at the beginning of June um what did it say it was like a little like one of those quote picture things and it said pride is important pride month is important because there's tonight there's someone out there who thinks that they're better off dead than being gay or being who they are fill in the blank whatever and that's so true you know what I mean and because this is just humans with everything like Uh, And again, one of the reasons why I started this podcast is people like forget their humanity because they get caught up in like intricate details and labels and needing to put things in boxes and like obviously religion and plays a big role in people's inability to accept certain certain things. Um, But I feel like people like don't understand like what Pride Month is, you know what I mean? And how... You know, I don't know if it's people just not wanting someone else to be in the spotlight or, you know, it's also people thinking that it's outside of their belief system or whatever it is. You know what I mean? A lot of it is political, too. But at the end of the day, like, if you paint it black and white like that, like, okay, doing this for somebody will help them not kill themselves. Like, if you really, like, paint it that simply then it shouldn't be so hard to accept, right? But people don't see it that way, you know what I mean? Because maybe they don't, this is something that I like really stress, speaking of mental health, is that you don't see people for most of their moments, right? So like someone existing as a human being for the majority of their life, like you don't see them and who they are you see that your interactions with them so you don't see most of people's good moments and you really don't see most of someone's bad moments so you know if someone's out here like I'm not even just talking about the people that are hateful and and like bigoted I'm talking about people who are you know maybe like a little bit Republican and a little bit judgy and a little bit like, oh, fucking Pride Month, like the left, blah, blah, blah. Even people like that, it's like, okay, like there are cancel culture people out there, right? Like I'm not denying that. Like there are people out there who are also hateful and resentful and like hate the other side just as much as the other side hates them, right? But that doesn't mean that you take that experience away from someone who really like needs it on a human level. Like if, if it were your child, you know what I mean? Which I guess some people don't even care if it's their child, but, and there's still pieces of shit about it. But, you know, if they were to really, you know, see what impact their words or their disapproval or their lack of support has on another human being, like if they were to see that person at the end of the night dealing with the thoughts or the staring or the little side comments, or anything like that, I wonder if it would be different, you know what I mean? Because I I can't, 
I have to hold on for my own sanity. I have to hold on to the belief that most people are good. You know what I mean? That like at the end of the day, like people want what's what's best for everyone. Um, they just get lost Mm -hmm. along the way. And that's what's hard is it's hard to be patient with people when you're hurting. You know, when you want to be like, you're hurting my feelings. Like you're the one that's hurting me right now. You're the one being bigoted. And then to have compassion for them, that's really hard. Like that's really challenging because you just kind of want to say, fuck you and like get out of my face and just don't ever talk to me again. Um, Do you feel like, you know, you struggle with being compassionate to people that are that are hateful or that are actually no. Um, and only because I it's not that I don't like being confrontational, but I like being confrontational in a productive way. Um, maybe this just is my background. I've always had a real interest in people and the way they interact. Um, my old job, I was working in like behavior analysis. So like it's my jam. Um, I don't think that that's a very productive way of going about things only because that almost like proves them right, right? It gives them this like confirmation bias that I think this person's going to be like this, so I'm going to treat them this way, and then they're going to act like this, and then I'm going to be like, oh, hey, this is how they are. So rather than doing that, as hard as it may be sometimes, I almost feel like I have to kind of be a representative for the trans community, and a lot of trans people do kind of feel this way, that we have to kind of be careful with what we say, how we say it, because we really do want people all to see us as humans. Like we want to be seen in a positive light. So lashing back and like, you know, just being disrespectful in return to them isn't always effective. There are times where I will say something right back and I'm like, maybe that wasn't the best idea. Doesn't matter. I'll still do it. And I don't make myself feel guilty for it. You know, I want to react authentically no matter what and not feel bad about it. So If somebody says something to me and my knee-jerk reaction is to clap back, fine. If they say something to me and I choose to compliment them instead and make them can reconsider their choice, okay. Regardless, I'm not going to feel bad about what I made myself do. I'm just trying to let myself live. Does that make sense? Yeah, I struggle with that too where I'm like because of my communications background, like I literally for four years was taught the appropriate way to handle these situations and about, you know, Saying that is only going to make it worse and blah, blah, blah. Sometimes, like, people just fucking deserve it and it needs to come out. Like, you're right. When you, it's especially hard when you're constantly, like, um, oh, what's the word? It's a psychology term. Like, you're, um, like, self-monitors, like, high mm. self-monitors. Like, when you're a high self-monitor and you're constantly, like, regulating your behavior and keeping your shit together and working on being the bigger person, sometimes it feels good to be not the bigger person, you know, and it needs to come out. Um, Absolutely. And not to interrupt you, but, no, like, that kind of brought something up in my mind. Um, a lot of times people will stigmatize queer people as, like, defensive or rude or, like, catty, but think about it. If you were to have an interaction with ten people, right, in a row, And the first nine were either somewhat bigoted or like outright bigoted and you kept it cool. But the 10th person comes up and you just blow up at them before they even said anything. It kind of makes sense, right? So queer people and people who are marginalized in general have this defense mechanism of like, I need to be kind of stoic. I need to be kind of like a hard ass. Like I can't show all this emotion up front because I think this person's going to be like rude to me. And I hate having to live that way, but all minority groups kind of understand that belief system, you know? Yeah, I understand that. Um, I do still think it's something that we have to fight. I I think that you guys, like, I mean, I'm Hispanic, so I guess it sort of applies, but, like, I have not been discriminated against the way that, you know, other people in the Hispanic community have. But, like, minorities got the short end of the stick, you know what I mean? Like, life is not fair, and I wish that things were different, right? Like, we shouldn't have to wake up every single day and think we're about to fight a battle you know like as a woman you know i'm not a minority but like it's i'm a group that is discriminated against right um and there's little things about that that piss me off where i'm like i want to come in and i want to treat like you know because i'm trying to like get into my career and stuff so i've dealt with you know over the last year like and i guess just my life in general like um certain not all but certain men in um, authority positions that just don't take me seriously um for whatever reason and i just want to like 
you know, it makes you angry. So you want to treat them like how you feel they deserve to be treated. And what's hard about that is like, there's a lot of minorities in the world. Like that's a significant portion of the human species. So if we all just like give up and say, oh, well, I'm, I'm tired. Like I know, like I know how tiring it must be. And there's like, it's got to come out sometimes. Like there's no way to be the bigger person all the time. But I think that that is a part of what makes the human experience so difficult. Like just on a, here comes spirituality, but just on like a soul level, being a human is hard. And like not succumbing to all the shit that exists in being a human and all the negative feelings is hard. And I think that each person has the choice to like give in or give up or, you know, to try and supersede it. It's like anything worth having is hard work. You know what I mean? And I think that, you know, self-work is one of the hardest forms of any any kind of work. You know what I mean? Physical labor, mental labor, um, emotional labor. Working on yourself is really hard. Um, but, like, I, I understand where you're coming from. Like, when hurt people hurt people, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. like, when, you're, when you've spent your whole life just trying to be taken seriously or be treated right, you know, like... You kind of just like fuck it, you exactly. know. I, I get it. I get it. Um, but I do still think that like I always have to choose like air on the side of love. I agree. You know. Yeah. So I just think I think that's always going to be a better option. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned that you have a psychology background, um, which is super interesting because that adds a whole layer to this because a lot of the people that have the most to say about, you know the lgbtq plus community know nothing about psychology are not educated in any way um they get their information from the bible or from um their ass or anywhere i don't know yeah. you know what i mean so um how has your background there affected your experience because i'm sure you've learned a lot about everything yeah so it's actually kind of made me refocus my energy <laughs> it's almost like a political game you've heard in politics that like the main focus is like the swing voter right i really don't care about the people that are extreme bigots nothing that i say or do is going to make them think differently of me so there's nothing that i need to do for them it's the people in the middle that need to understand like the severity of what's going on like you mentioned with like people are like oh pride month those are the people that need to understand like what pride month actually is they're the ones that need to know like what queer people actually go through so they can make a decision on whether or not they support queer liberation or whether they're against it. Because when it comes to like humanitarian issues, I really don't feel like there's a middle ground. Like gay rights, there should not be a middle ground. Um, Women's rights, like women's health rights, there should not be a middle ground. Like you can't sit on the fence with such extreme like black or white issues. You know, I just don't feel like you can. So in the queer community, Extreme bigots, I just, I really don't care. My energy is not there for them. Yeah. Um, Because you learn about how literally their brain works and is wired and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Because like, well, so I have a, a psychology background and a sociology background. Long story short, psychology is like your own individual mind. Sociology is the way that everyone's minds work and like how it creates like norms. Um, so that's why I think so many norms are stupid because they were all created collectively by everybody's like individual mind. Like they just put it all together and then we're like, hey, like this sounds like something we could all abide by. But really like none of these norms are rooted in anything that's actually based on like morality. A lot of it is rooted on like, like you said, like the Bible, or it's rooted in just like what the status quo has been since the beginning of time. Like that is part of the reason why it takes so long for like people's rights to come to fruition. Like women didn't even get voting rights until like the 60s or 70s and that was just because like it was the status quo like men were always just in power so men would always argue that that's just the way it is you hear that a lot when it comes to like queer rights now it's like oh that's just the way it was that's just the way things were um sorry that's just i was born in a different generation as if these things are like excuses and it just bugs the hell out of me because they're not excuses like you have no right to infringe on somebody else's life 
um, when they don't affect you at all. So in terms of like spirituality and everything, um, I'm actually not religious at all, but I follow like a moral code. Like if, if you're not doing something that's affecting anybody in any way, then I don't care. But if you're like infringing on somebody's rights, if you're hurting them, causing harm to anybody, including your own self, that's where I have an issue, you know? Yeah. I think that the problem is that people find a way to be like, no, it is affecting me, you know? So, because I, I believe that same thing and I use that argument um, frequently. And then I'm usually met with some way that it does affect them, right? Like maybe some of it's valid, you know, depending on what issue we're talking about. Um, like, for example, and this will be a different episode um, later on in the season, but I am um, pro-choice mm -hmm. for sure. I think that, you know, it's my body. It's my choice. But I can understand why people are pro-life. It doesn't mean that I agree with them, but I can at least see how their brain gets to where they are at. Mm -hmm. And this is what is hard because um, I'm very independent i'm very in the middle um i don't even know if i like saying in the middle because then i'm like kind of going with this narrative that there's two sides yeah which i think is stupid i don't think that's what it is i think it's more so like like you said independent like free thinking like right a party system is not something that we should even be abiding by in the first place kind of thing yeah, yeah. there's there's nuance to everything right um and how i see it especially with my communications background is that if there's something that we disagree about and you're coming to me and trying to change my mind on it or trying to get me to see it from your perspective, you bear the burden of making me give a fuck. Like, you just do. As inconvenient as it is or as much as you wish that, you know, I would just see things or that it's so clear to you, maybe in your head it's, like, so clear to you. If you're coming to me, bringing this conversation to me, you bear the burden of making me care about what you care about. Because if I don't care, then everything you say is going to fall on deaf ears. And it usually comes down to like a value system, right? Because I, um, I had a bunch of conversations with people because um, the abortion stuff has been big in the mm -hmm. news lately. Um, so I had a bunch of conversations with people. Um, Usually it's pro-life people that reach out to me because of my podcast. I post stuff and they know I'm open to those conversations. Um, so usually it's not the people that already agree with me that are like confronting me, which is great because I don't want to be like involved in confirmation bias and stuff. That's why I started this podcast. Um, but it's, it's them sending me like these arguments, right? Or like giving their opinion. and. It might be rooted in example for family, like maybe their value, because I did speech and debate. So your whole argument at the top of it, you, at least my debate that I did was Lincoln Douglas. So it's a values debate. So at the top of your argument, you'd have a value that withstood throughout your entire argument. So it might be um, utilitarianism, which is the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people. It might be pragmatism, which is what makes sense. Um, for the abortion debate, you know, there were some people that, ex for example, were talking about family and how, how abortion is detrimental to the family. And I was like, well, what if I don't give a fuck about family? Like, what if I grew up in a broken family and I don't believe in family? Or what if, you know, my family did me dirty? Or like, what if I'm someone that, you know, grew up in the foster system? Like, what does family mean to me? So again, that person, if you want me to care about what you're caring about and see what you see, then you have to align your values with mine, right? Like the hardest thing is finding that common ground. What do we both agree on? What is something, what is the part of this issue that intersects for both of us, right? Um, for like something in, in the trans community, it might be like identity. Right. Like that might be a good one when you're going into a conversation with somebody like, all right, what's what do you like about yourself? What's important? Like about you, like when you look in the mirror and you see something like what would you feel empty without? Now, imagine that you really don't have it, you know, like 
imagine that that part of you was stripped away or gone and you woke up one day it was just gone and then imagine what your identity would feel like you know and that's where I feel like people struggle is finding that bridge um you're right about the bigots like they're a lost cause um luckily I don't think that that's the majority of people um but you can't someone like that you just can't it's like being in a cult you know like they know no different they will never know any different um which i'm sure you've learned a lot about in psychology Mm -hmm. um because that's where i learned about cults and stuff what have you learned um specifically about like the trans experience like because there's a lot like there's this big argument that um like it's just it's a choice or that um people who want this are mentally ill like what have you learned from a psychological perspective about the trans experience um okay so a lot of things um there's this old like research from i don't even know when it was from it was like this little quiz that i took when i was like eight years old and it was like what do you have a male brain or like a female brain and i was like what this is so weird and i took it and it said i had like a female brain and i was like oh whatever okay but there's actually some truth to that so Trans women specifically, I mean, I don't know a lot about the rest of the trans community. I do need to know a little bit more, but my experience is obviously male to female. So this is kind of like what I know. Um, Trans women have, like their brain operates in a way that is a lot more in tune with the way that cis women's brain operates. Like it is a more feminine style of like thinking. Um, And, you know, the biology of it all is where people really do start to get into weird arguments, especially when it comes to, like, trans women in sports and, like, all these things. But even there, like, there's so much more flexibility than people actually think. And if they knew that, I don't think the trans women in sports debate would be so big. I don't think that, like, the issue of, like, men versus women would be so big because... There are just so many things, and sorry if I'm, like, rambling a little bit. No, yeah. There are just so many, um, like, biological characteristics that vary in every single human, like, regardless of your assigned sex at birth. Like, um, in fact, the trans women in sports thing, there was a study done, no, not a study, a test done in 1996 for the Olympics. Um, they tested, like, chromosomal testing on women athletes as a way to be like, okay, like, if you have a Y chromosome, you're obviously transgender, you shouldn't be competing, right? Um, multiple cisgender women athletes had Y chromosomes come up because um, more people fall under the intersex category of the queer community than they know about. Um, It has to do with like, there are syndromes called like androgen and sensitivity syndrome um, where you just have like, I don't know a lot about the science of it, but essentially what I'm saying is just that there's a lot more gray area than people come to realize when it comes to like the mental aspects and the physical aspects of your body as a, as a human being. So for trans women, you know, um, our brains really are more like, like female brains. You know, we don't really think that way. It's not a choice. You know, when we grow up, we are rooted in the way of thinking that we're rooted in. And also my favorite argument to that is like, oh, it's a choice. It's a choice. Would I choose this? <laughs> like, is this easier? Is this easier? Would I choose to be discriminated against? Would I choose to get looked at and stared at every day? No, <laughs> but this is who I am. And I felt a thousand times more uncomfortable living as a man than I do now. Even if I didn't get looked at by anybody ever, I still felt more uncomfortable then than I do now. And that kind of shows that it really isn't a choice. And who you are is who you are. It just is a matter of like accepting it and being authentic to yourself. Right. Um, So you had mentioned that you have not had gender affirmation surgery. And you said you want to talk about why that is. Why did you decide not to? Yeah. So there are a few surgeries that I do want to get. Um, So all the surgeries that a trans person would get do fall under that category of like gender affirming surgeries. Um, But the specific one that I think you're referring to and that is like the big one that everyone always asks about is like um, sex reassignment surgery. Yeah. Um, that is one that I'm not going to get. Um, and there are multiple reasons. One of them being that it's kind of risky. Um, you can lose some sensation down there. There's like aftercare procedures that you really need to follow. Um, just little things that can go on that it, it's a big procedure and it's something that not everyone's automatically ready for. But also... Um, Uh, My sexuality kind of allows me to 
be fluid in the people that I like. And I don't really have a lot of dysphoria when it comes to my <laughs> downstairs friend. Some people really don't like the look of it. And honestly, like when it comes to like how I look in clothes, I, I tuck. I don't like the way that it looks in clothes. Like I prefer to have that more like flat look to me. So in that right, for the aesthetic purpose of it, you know, I would kind of like to have a flatter front. Um, but in terms of like actual like sex and sexuality, I have no problem with it and I have no problem like using it. Um, I'm a switch. I don't know if anybody knows what that means, but <laughs> yeah. So I just, I'm kind of free and open with it and I don't really see a need for it to go away. Okay. Um, so I guess that varies, you know, that's your personal experience. So I guess that varies probably from like trans person to trans person. It does. Yeah. And it, a lot of trans people want the surgery, but either don't get it for like financial reasons or like they just don't have access or they're too scared. Or th There's so many reasons why people don't get it. Um, I don't remember the exact statistic, but I think it's a majority. A majority of trans women don't have the surgery um, or have not had the surgery yet, at least according to like recent like surveys. Um, I think it's like what, 20 percent or something get the surgery. And then with trans men, it's about like. 10% get the surgery down there, the bottom surgery. Um, so it's a really low number when you think about the actual number of trans people that exist, um, which is kind of fascinating, kind of cool, but at the same time, it brings up the question of like, why do people care so much about what's in between someone's legs? Like, if there's so many of these women and men and non-binary people just that are transitioning and looking the way they are, whether they're passing or not, living their lives freely, why do people care so much about what's in between their legs, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what, so you said you did want to get some surgeries. What does that involve? Like, what kind of surgeries other than sex reassignment surgery would yeah. fall under that? So there's a few. Um, a lot of them do have to do with, like, aesthetic features. And that gets a little bit of backlash from people outside the community because they think that trans women are, like, vain or, like, self-obsessed. And it's like... Not really, but we do have this like feeling that we need to keep up an image. Like we will do anything and everything to fit in with our cisgender women peers. So that's why so many of these surgeries become a thing. So me personally, I've wanted a nose job since I was like 10. Um, I'm going to get my Adam's apple kind of shaved down so it's not as noticeable. Um, I don't need a brow ridge. Um, surgery, but a lot of people have like a brow ridge that kind of sticks out when you're assigned male at birth. Um, so sometimes they'll get that shaved down. Um, there's a variety of surgeries that you can get, but as far as like what I want, it's pretty much just the nose, the Adam's apple, and then if my breasts don't grow enough, then I'll get a boob job. And that, that grows with the hormones, yes. Mm -hmm. It's estrogen. Yes. So okay. I take a testosterone blocker and then I take estrogen and progesterone to kind of like balance out the effects because okay. in everybody's body um you have a certain level of testosterone and estrogen and pretty much what i'm doing is just balancing it out so it goes the other way more estrogen less testosterone right and it does help with like the breast growth yeah i think i just got measured about a month ago and i'm like a 36b right now and that's, that's bigger after... than me <laughs> it's okay i think it's because i'm like tall and like big like shoulders too but either way yeah um that was only after like eight months so it really does vary though because some trans women will be on it for like years and still only have an A cup. And then some trans women are really lucky and they get like D's within like a year. And it's like kind of the same way it is for cis women, you know, it's just random. Yeah, right. Well, I got the short end of the stick when it comes to boobs. I'll tell you that still much. Still look great. It's okay. <laughs> um, so you said it's not. So the surgery you mentioned, like the financial aspect being like a blocker, that's not something that would be covered by insurance, huh? So actually, it's um, the two main surgeries, as in like bottom surgery and then like breast augmentation, are covered by insurance. Um, even if it's not like the entirety of it, they cover like a pretty big portion it's of it. Because it's good for transitioning. Yeah. So when it comes to like transgender surgeries, the ones that are like critical, like actually like gender affirming, the way the law puts it, are the ones that get insured. So like the ones that you would really need to feel more in line with your body. So they're saying like the other ones, like the nose job and like the Adam's apple shape, all those are cosmetic surgeries, things that, yeah, they would help you to kind of like fit into that role, but they're not necessarily required for you to feel aligned. Mm, okay, that makes sense. 
Um, and I wonder, I don't know if you know this, does it vary by state? Yeah, or? it okay. does. I think, yeah, the states where um, there's still like anti, no, not anti, there's still like transgender like discrimination in place because there's no laws against it. There's mm-hmm. not really a lot of like health care for them in okay. those states. Yeah. Okay. Um, so does it bother you to discuss your identity before you transitioned or do you still see him like as a part of who you are? I still see that like part of my life as a part of my life. Um, I have no problem talking about it, but it is kind of like weird just because it's like, <laughs> that's not who I am. So I'm not super interested in it. But if somebody else like wants to know about it, I have no problem like talking about it. Yeah. Because okay. for me, I'm just like, I don't really have any ties to it. I think about it and I'm like, where, because my dead name was Nick. Um, some people know that, some don't. I really don't care. Um, for a lot of trans people, though, like, their dead name is that. It's dead. Like, they really don't want you to ever say it. They don't want you to bring it up. And it's because there's often a lot of trauma behind it if they did have a harder time with it. Um, but for me, it wasn't like I had a hard life as Nick. You know, I I played sports up until I was in college. Um, I had a lot of friends, you know, guy friends, girlfriends. It, it was kind of separate. It was kind of funny. I felt so weird. A lot of my girlfriends, as in, like, all of my girlfriends, knew about me. and then like. 99% of my guy friends had no idea at all. I don't know how I was able to like play that line so tightly, but it was really nice not having to when I finally did come out. Mm-hmm. Um. Um, I saw this like clip of um, the Kardashians and it made me, I wanted to ask you about it because I just never thought about it um, from, you know, it's different because um, Bruce and um, what's her name? What's the mom's name? Chris. Chris. Yeah. They, you know, they were married for so long. Um, and I saw this video of her talking to Caitlin, and she was like crying, and she was, "Have you seen it?" Where mm-hmm. she's saying like, "Wait, was I ever married? Like, um, does does he exist anymore?" Do, so, do you know anything about like? I don't know if it happened in your particular experience where there's other people in your life that were like mourning the loss of this other person that they felt that they knew. But do you have, if you haven't experienced that, do you have any sort of like opinion on like that side of things? Um, I never really experienced it directly. The closest really was like um, me, like right before I came out, I was in a really long relationship with somebody that I probably shouldn't have been with. Um, She was great, but. It just I wasn't who I was. And I do feel kind of bad in that instance because she was in a relationship with somebody who not didn't exist, but really wasn't like the full version of themselves, you know. So in that way, I did feel kind of bad. So relating that to like the whole like Caitlyn Jenner situation, I do see where Chris is a little bit upset just because a big part of her life was kind of altered, I guess. But I also think she kind of failed to look at it from Caitlyn's perspective that regardless of the experiences they had together, Caitlyn is Caitlyn and likely was still Caitlyn when they were together, even if it was in the closet. Like, because when I was dating my ex, like, I mean, I still knew I liked girls, but I kind of knew I was a girl, you know, and she didn't know that. But for me, that's kind of weird to have to say that because it's like, I don't want to think about that part of my life because I'm a little bit ashamed of the fact that I had to hide it. So for someone else to kind of turn that and make it about them would be a little frustrating, I think. Um, yeah. But I don't think she really saw it that way. I don't think she took the time to kind of realize that. So I wouldn't like throw shade at her for it or anything. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I think about it from, you know, obviously out of the two experiences, like there's a substantial difference there. But I do I can't help but relate to her just because I have to put myself in her shoes. Not that her experience is more important than Caitlin's, but it is like mourning somebody. You know, it, it's like a loss. It's like a, a death in a way. Because I think about, um, you know, my current partner. And if that were to be the case... I I would probably feel something similar. Not that I don't want him to be happy. Like if I if that was what he wanted, then that's what he wants and I would never hold him back from that. But it's still it's like a like a a huge loss. You know what I mean? Especially if you weren't ready to separate from that person. You know what I mean? So I see 
Um, not that, I, I don't know if I would say even that I see it as selfish because I think she's been pretty good about like, in like uh, validating Caitlyn's identity. Um, but I see where she's coming from because I think she's just like kind of replaying things in her head and moments and memories. It's like a breakup, you know, like it's, you can't help but do that. And I think that, um, not that that, not that what other people would grieve or, or lose should ever hold someone back, yeah. but it's just, she goes to show there's like so many layers that make this a difficult experience. And like you were saying before, why would someone choose to do that? Like, just because they're bored or because they're like, I want to try something different and then put other people through that, put themselves through it. Like, that's just even more of a case as to why this is something that is hard for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, Before I move on from that, did you want to add anything? Yes, actually, because I like what you brought up about how, like, you don't see her as selfish because I don't either. Um, I do want to clarify that, like, she had every right to feel the way that she does about the situation, just like my ex probably had every right to feel the way that she felt about me and what I was doing. Um, Just because I did that and just because Bruce did that before she transitioned into her, you know, true self, doesn't mean that what we did was okay. Um, It's something that a lot of trans people go through, and it's not like it's our fault when we're trying to figure ourselves out, but that doesn't really take away the accountability part of it. Like, regardless, like, I still hurt somebody, you know? Caitlin still hurt somebody, and that person has a right to be upset about it. Um, But, yeah, I do agree. I think she's been very supportive of Caitlin's transition, and, like, I think she's been above and beyond, so... Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, is is there one thing that you feel like, like one main thing? I'm sure there's many things, but is there one like big thing or if you had to pick one um, that you wish people understood about the transgender experience? Yes. The biggest one would be that we are humans just like you. Um, my favorite thing is that men are often so uncomfortable around me because they have a lack of experience around queer people in general. Um, I just started a new job like two days ago and we've been having orientation, right? And it's like a class of about 30 people and we're from all different walks of life, right? The men in that group are from so many different backgrounds, but I've had some of the most authentic, genuine, comfortable conversations ever in the last two days because that kind of fostering, nurturing environment was like, brought on by the company that we work for. It's the Cosmopolitan, by the way. Great hotel. Go stay there. Um, so yeah, I really just think if men in general and people would take the time to realize that we are all human, um, they would realize they have a lot more in common with us than they think. Right. Um, is there anything else that you want to add that I didn't cover? I can't really think of anything. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, I think that that's all I have for you. Thank you so much for your time and your vulnerability. Um, I respect you deeply for this. Um, and I appreciate you shedding light on this topic. If any of you would like to continue the conversation with Sophia, I will have some of her contact info available on my social media sites. Thank you all for your patience and understanding. And I hope that you have learned something or gained some perspective. I will see you again in two weeks to talk more elephants.